Former President Donald Trump is scheduled to lie under oath today in that big civil fraud trial here in New York City. I'll tell you what to expect and how I think it all plays out. This is the mop up for November 6, 2023. I'm David Feldman. Please like this episode, share it with your friends via social media or in an email. And most importantly, leave a comment. I read all your comments. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Russell Brand is being sued by another woman. This one said he exposed himself on the set of Arthur back in 2010 and then sexually assaulted her later in a bathroom while crew members kept guard for him. On September 15th, Britain's Channel 4 investigative show Dispatches interviewed at least four women who said they were assaulted by Brand, one who was as young as 16 at the time. Brand swerved to the right recently, presenting as a wellness guru, parroting anti-vax talking points and praising fascists like Ron DeSantis. The United States has a serious shortage of Adderall, and judging by Don Jr.'s testimony in last week's civil fraud trial, I got a rough idea who's been gobbling it all up. The DEA administrator, Ann Milgram, on Friday accused Adderall retailers of slowing down production and not meeting production limits imposed upon them by her agency. Milgram said the DEA contacted the 18 manufacturers of Adderall, urging them to increase production, and said all but one have agreed to do so. Millions of American children rely on Adderall to regulate sleep and mood. Parents report driving 500 miles to track down a pharmacy that can fill their child's prescription. It's pretty serious stuff. You, you can't put a child on a drug like Adderall and then say, no, no more because we can't find any. It's not fair. Parents insist the drug often makes the difference between a child who thrives and one who does not. You're looking at Demetrius Kazukis, who serves on the board of directors for Clover Health, which, according to the Huffington Post, makes millions convincing seniors to supplement their Medicare with Medicare Advantage, which Huffington Post says rips off customers to the tune of $140 billion a year. This is common knowledge that Medicare Advantage rips off customers to the tune of $140 billion a year, and seniors should not be using Medicare Advantage. So you're thinking, this guy, Kazukis, so what? He's just another health insurance industry scumbag who belongs in prison, but since this is America, it's never going to happen. And you'd be right in thinking that, but flying under the radar, President Joe Biden has nominated him to serve on the Board of Trustees for Medicare and Social Security programs. Granted, he's not going to be running Medicare or Social Security, but he will, if confirmed, serve as an advisor on how to improve, quote-unquote, the efficiencies of Medicare. He sits on the board of a company that makes its money privatizing Medicare. So it's clearly not unreasonable to assume this guy would push for any regulations that transition seniors towards Medicare Advantage or any other privatized health insurance company that piggybacks on top of the success of real Medicare. Democrats like Elizabeth Warren, who sit on the Senate Finance Committee, tried but failed to block Kazukis' nomination from being brought to the floor for a full vote. His nomination sailed through the committee with a vote of 23 to 4. Only four people voted against sending him to the floor. This is the Senate. These aren't Republicans. This is the Senate where Democrats are in charge. And Kazukis is a Biden pick. During hearings, Kazukis refused to tell Warren, Senator Warren, whether he would stop working for Clover, and he refused to address the role Clover plays in Medicare fraud. 
Senator Warren said Kazukis clearly has a conflict of interest, adding it's in his best interest to further the privatization of Medicare. The Huffington Post reports Biden nominated Kazukis based on a recommendation from Senate Minority Leader Republican Mitch McConnell, and Biden was hoping Kazukis would fly under the radar. He hasn't been confirmed yet. Contact your senator. Tell your senator to say no to Kazukis. Kazukis, it sounds like something Medicare should be treating, not uh, naming as a trustee. The UN's Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Olivier Deschutes, accused Amazon, Walmart, and DoorDash of trapping their workers in endless cycles of poverty. Deschutes, the UN Special Rapporteur, said these companies pay so little, their workers turn to the United States government for special assistance, which others have pointed out is another way in which U.S. taxpayers subsidize these corporations. They don't pay a livable wage, so they're forced to go on food stamps and get rent subsidies. If Walmart, Amazon, DoorDash paid anything but starvation wages, the taxpayers could be spared. In a letter to the CEOs of these companies, he wrote, quote, I'm extremely disturbed that workers in some of the world's most profitable companies in one of the richest countries on earth are struggling to afford to eat or pay their rent. He then added, quote, multi-billion dollar companies should be setting the standard for working conditions and wages, not violating the human rights of their workers by failing to pay them a decent wage. Deschutes then called these CEOs out for their well-orchestrated, well-funded campaigns where they pay corporate attorneys to engage in union busting. Deschutes said a livable wage and freedom to form a union without fear of reprisal is recognized under international law as a fundamental human right. He called on the United Nations and the world community to hold the United States government and these corporations accountable for violating these human rights of American citizens who are trying to earn a living. In a special report over the summer, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Olivier Deschutes said globally, One out of five workers live in poverty. They're working and they're in poverty. He blamed this partly on the decline of unions as well as the reclassification of employees as contractors. Schutz says the trend towards labeling Uber drivers, for example, labeling them as contractors instead of employees, is one of the leading drivers of poverty for the working poor. Tomorrow is Election Day here in the United States. In Mississippi, Republican Governor Tate Reeves is in a dead heat running against his Democratic challenger, the pro-gun, pro-life public service commissioner named Brandon Presley. That's right, Presley. He is a second cousin to Elvis. The Economist says Mississippi is the sickest, fattest, and of course, poorest state in America. The Economist points out that the Republican governor, Tate Reeves, takes pride in making certain that Mississippi is one of just 10 states left in America that refuses to take Medicaid expansion offered to it through Obamacare. He refuses to accept $1 billion a year from Obamacare so those living at or below the poverty line in Mississippi can get medical care. This is in a state where one out of six residents don't have any insurance at all. Half the rural hospitals in Mississippi are on the brink of shutting down. And there is reportedly one doctor for every 4,000 children living along the Delta. The Economist says 70% of Republicans in Mississippi want Medicaid expansion. So why do they vote Republican? Because there are more important things 
for these Republicans than life or death, like owning libs. That's more satisfying to own a lib than not to die. Mississippi has the highest infant mortality rate in America. But you know who overturned Roe v. Wade? The state of Mississippi. Last year, the Supreme Court ruled in Dobbs that Mississippi's Gestational Age Act was constitutional. And it was the right of these individual states like Mississippi to ban most abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Dobbs, the Dobbs decision was specifically about Mississippi's Gestational Age Act. The state with the highest infant mortality rate in America thinks their most pressing issue is making sure a 15-year-old girl brings her uncle's baby to term. Mississippi. And these people get two senators. But Washington, D.C. doesn't get one. Washington, D.C. doesn't even have a member of Congress. There's a race for governor in Kentucky. Republican Attorney General Daniel Cameron is running neck and neck with Kentucky Democratic Governor Andy Beshear, who wants another four years. One would think the Republican Cameron would have it in the bag, considering Donald Trump beat Biden in Kentucky by 26 points. Kentucky also sent Mitch McConnell, the Senate Minority Leader, and Rand Paul to Washington, D.C. The Economist, however, is predicting that the Democratic governor, Andy Beshear, should cruise to victory. A Democratic governor getting reelected in Kentucky tomorrow. It might be because of abortion. That's what The Economist is suggesting. Kentucky has some of America's most severe anti-abortion laws, making no exception for rape or incest. Just like the 2022 midterms, we are seeing abortion on the ballot once again. And if it's on the ballot, that's good for Democrats. Voters in Ohio will decide whether to enshrine the right to an abortion in their state constitution tomorrow. Ohio used to be considered a swing state, but in the past decade, it's become solidly red, at least uh, when it comes to presidential politics. $72 million has been spent on Ohio's issue one. This is the issue, the referendum putting abortion inside the state constitution, enshrining it. $42 million was spent on, by those in favor of the initiative, and $30 million was spent trying to kill it. Also on the ballot in Ohio, tomorrow is a measure to legalize marijuana with a 10% tax on any sales. The initiative allows not just for sale, but home cultivation. $6 million has been spent by the people in support of legalizing marijuana, half a million has been spent by those opposed to legalizing marijuana in Ohio. Two big votes tomorrow in Ohio, abortion and marijuana. All 100 seats in the Virginia House of Delegates are up for grabs tomorrow. The Republicans currently hold 48 seats, Democrats 46, and there are six vacancies. So the Republicans control the House of Delegates. In the Virginia State Senate, all 40 seats up for grabs with Democrats controlling the Senate. They have the majority holding 22 seats to the Republicans, 18. Virginia has divided government with Republican Governor Greg Youngkin. New polling on the 2024 California Senate race shows Congresswoman Katie Porter and Congressman Adam Schiff taking the lead. The seat they're fighting for was held by Dianne Feinstein, who before dying this year, announced she would not seek another term. Kirsten Sinema, the Arizona senator who was a Democrat, but this year began running for re-election as an independent, is doing horribly with voters. That's according to internal Republican polling that was leaked late last week. Kirsten Sinema places last in a three-way against election denier and failed candidate for governor Carrie Lake. She comes in second. And Democratic Congresswoman Ruben Gallego is placing first. Gallego is an Iraq war vet, 
and he surprised Democrats with the millions of dollars in contributions he reported in the last quarter. We like Ruben Gallego, and I will pronounce his name properly uh, soon. Cinema, along with West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin, served as thorns in Joe Biden's progressive agenda, blocking ambitious improvements to our social safety net. They claim they were serving their fictitious conservative constituents who they claim, despite woefully impoverished, they claim for some reason they're woefully impoverished constituents in Arizona and West Virginia want to rein in government spending. Blow me. Manchin, too, is up for re-election in 2024, and like cinema, his fundraising hall is lagging. Manchin might not seek another term. He could run for president as an independent on the no-labels ticket or retire. Pennsylvania Senator John Fetterman told the Washington Post, Manchin, he thinks... He thinks it's highly unlikely that Manchin is going to seek another term in the Senate. And then Fetterman said, jokingly, I hope I get his parking spot. Manchin recently complained about progressive Democrats demonizing him for taking more money from the fossil fuel industry than any other member of Congress while fighting the Green New Deal. Manchin is a, a liar. He blamed inflation on Biden's raft of spending bills, despite Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell saying last year's inflation was unrelated to fiscal spending. The inflation, he says, was triggered by supply chain issues stemming from COVID, the war in Ukraine, and rising fuel costs. But if you're Joe Manchin and you're representing one of the poorest states in America, of course, you'd want to rein in spending to serve your constituents, because the last thing the poor people of West Virginia need are food stamps, better schools, free health care, free Internet, free child care and lower out of pocket expenses on prescription drugs. Now, if you ask his fictitious constituents in West Virginia, they want to rein in spending. Independent candidate for president Bobby Kennedy Jr. said when he's elected, he would order the National Institutes of Health to, quote, give infectious disease a break for eight years. Kennedy said he'd tell them to lay off measles and COVID and focus on diabetes and obesity. New polling suggests that in the general election, Kennedy is most likely to siphon voters away from Donald Trump and former basketball great Meadowlark Lemon, who is no longer with us. That's uh, strange. Uh, Florida Governor, are we still here? Yes, there we are. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' campaign is generally considered on life support, but later today, his feeding tube will get an extra dose of protein when Iowa's Republican Governor Kim Reynolds officially endorses him for president. This isn't so much good news for DeSantis as it is bad news for Donald Trump. The GOP governor of Iowa is signaling to voters in her state it's OK to be brave and not support the mafia Don. The Trump campaign responded to news of Reynolds' endorsement by saying, quote, Kim Reynolds apparently has begun her retirement tour early as she clearly does not have any ambition for higher office. A not so veiled threat. It's pretty much out in the open. They don't even hide it anymore, the Trump campaign. If you make an enemy of Tony Soprano or Donald Trump, he won't rest until you're out of politics. This isn't about policy. This is about loyalty and fear, which begs the question, how many Republican office holders are going to shed a tear if and when Donald Trump goes away for a couple of years? Now, they might pretend to be upset, but that's only because they're terrified of him. This is the mop up for November 6, 2023. I'm David Feldman reminding you tomorrow's election day. Make sure you vote, especially in your local elections that aren't getting too much attention. 
If you're not sure who to vote for, it's always a safe bet to go with the Democrat. Please like this episode, share it with your friends via email or on Twitter or Facebook or any other social media and leave a comment. In a move reminiscent of Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential run, Nikki Haley is refusing to divulge what she said in several speeches that she was paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to deliver after her term as U.N. ambassador for Donald Trump came to an end. She refuses to say what she said. Sound familiar? Meanwhile, there is growing consensus among the never-Trumpers inside the GOP that Nikki Haley's surge in polling and raking in campaign cash suggests she is the only one who can beat Donald Trump. These never-Trumpers are urging the rest of the pack to drop out now so the Trump resistance solidifies around one candidate— Many look back to 2016 and insist had the field not been so crowded, Donald Trump would have had trouble stealing the nomination from an establishment candidate like Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio. New polling shows Nikki Haley surpassing DeSantis in New Hampshire, making her the more likely second place finisher behind Donald Trump who still holds a commanding lead in the Granite State. Iowa, always the wild card, could surprise everyone by awarding her with a come-from-behind victory or a strong second finish, second-place finish. The Des Moines Register shows Nikki Haley tied for second right now in Iowa with Ron DeSantis. After New Hampshire comes South Carolina, where, as a former governor, she should have the home court advantage. Senator Tim Scott is also from South Carolina, but his campaign is running out of cash. The rich donors wanted to meet his girlfriend, and they haven't met her. That's what they said. We want to meet your girlfriend. He said, I have one. And they said, we're not going to give you any money unless we meet her. And he hasn't introduced her. Establishment Republicans, if there are any left, see Nikki Haley as a dutiful subordinate to the power brokers who ruled the Republican Party before Donald Trump came around. As a former governor and U.N. ambassador, Haley's foreign policy and executive branch credentials are beginning to reassure donors who are impressed by her innate ability to internalize well-sculpted talking points manufactured by her handlers. She is good. If you watch her in the debates, she knows how to spit out what she's been told to say. Now, historically, Republicans have always had their frontrunner alongside a revolving door of frontrunner challengers, But in the end, the front runners like George W. Bush, McCain, Romney and Trump always seem to prevail in the end. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie urged Democrats in New Hampshire to cross party lines and vote in the 2024 Republican primary for anyone but Donald Trump. Now, Joe Biden isn't running in New Hampshire, and that means Democrats essentially have nobody to vote for. New Hampshire primaries allow unregistered Republicans to vote in the Republican Party so long as they're not registered Democrats. As long as you're not, if you're a registered voter and you're not registered as a Democrat, you can vote. There's a pool of roughly 344,000 registered voters in New Hampshire with no party affiliation who could end up flooding the voting booths during the New Hampshire primary, and we may be surprised. Politico reports that about 4,000 Democrats in New Hampshire have switched their party affiliation to undeclared or Republican so that they could have permission to vote in the GOP primary. Uh, New Hampshire could be interesting. Rolling Stone 
Magazine reports Rudy Giuliani told Donald Trump no matter how much they squeeze him, he will not testify against the former president. I think if you squeeze Rudy, brown chunky bile comes out his nose and ears. Somebody should try that. Rolling Stone points out loyalty is a one-way street with Donald Trump and that Rudy repeatedly asked for help with his legal fees, but all Trump offered was a sparsely attended fundraiser for America's mayor at Trump's golf club in New Jersey. They charged $100,000 a plate to pay his legal fees, and all he could pay his lawyers was $10,000. Gee, I wonder what happened to them. Who would have taken it? Who would have walked off with it? Hmm. Perhaps one of the reasons Rudy can, pr can promise that he's not going to flip is because nobody is asking him to flip. It's like James Corden telling CBS, don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. And CBS said, yes, you are. You're canceled. Down in Georgia, where the RICO trial was taking place, Rudy is considered either the second in command right under Trump or possibly third in command right under Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows. So in other words, he's too high up the food chain to flip. He's the reason for the RICO trial, right? You get other people to flip, to lock Rudy up. Now, perhaps he could flip, but Rudy's testimony would be highly suspect since he's already proven himself to be a prodigious liar and a drunk and a fool. House Majority Leader Steve Scalise, who was the nominee for Speaker for about 10 seconds. Well, Scalise appeared on ABC News yesterday morning and was asked six times whether he believed Joe Biden stole the 2020 election. And six times Scalise refused to say, no, I don't think he stole the election. Right? Scalise could not say, he's so afraid of Donald Trump. He could not say that the Democrats didn't steal the election. In three years, Nobody in the Republican Party can produce a single shred of evidence that Democrats stole the election in 2020. But, you know, this is the party of religion. So they, you, they, they don't need proof. You know, just believe it. Just believe it. The publisher of former Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows' biography said they want their money back. In Meadows' book, published in 2021, he wrote that there was absolutely, uh, he, he wrote that there was proof that Donald Trump had, had won the 2020 election. But now Meadows has flipped and has reportedly told special counsel Jack Smith in the Washington, D.C. election interference trial against Donald Trump, Meadows has told him that there was not a single shred of evidence suggesting voter fraud even though he, Rudy Giuliani, and of course Donald Trump, insisted that there was. Meadows is now going to testify against Donald Trump in the Washington, D.C. election interference trial and say there was not any evidence, none whatsoever. So the publisher of Meadows' autobiography said, we want our money back. Well, get in line because he doesn't have any. An appeals court has temporarily frozen Donald Trump's gag order in that Washington, D.C. election interference case. Judge Tanya Chutkin issued a narrowly tailored gag order preventing Trump from intimidating witnesses like Mark Meadows. Then she froze the gag order to listen to appeals. And after listening to the appeal, she decided to unfreeze it. And now Trump's attorneys have taken the gag order before an appeals court. So it's frozen once again. Jack Smith, the special counsel, insists this gag order is necessary to prevent Donald Trump from intimidating witnesses, endangering the lives of people who work for the courts, and contaminating potential jury pools. Judge Chutkin told Trump's attorneys that if this were any other defendant behaving this poorly He'd already be placed in pretrial detention. That's Sam Bankman Freed was put in pretrial detention uh, for violating gag orders. They do this all the time. 
The judge in Donald Trump's second defamation case, this one is scheduled for January and it's filed by E. Jean Carroll. It's her second defamation case against Donald Trump. She won the first one and she's won the second one. Uh, they're just determining, the trial is just to determine how much Donald Trump has to pay her. And the judge in that trial ruled that the names of the jurors will remain anonymous to guarantee their safety. Trump has already lost this case, and the purpose of the trial is to determine how much he owes Carol, who a previous jury earlier this year ruled Donald Trump had raped her and then defamed her. You have the leading candidate for the Republican nomination found guilty of rape in the E. Jean Carroll trial and in the current civil fraud trial, guilty of defrauding insurance companies and banks, found guilty already. Uh, uh, the judge in this case, uh, in deciding the jurors must remain anonymous, said he based his decision on Trump's recent violations of gag orders. These violations prove Trump can't be trusted with the lives of citizens who agree to sit on juries. Well, here we go. Donald Trump takes the stand today in that big civil fraud trial filed by New York State Attorney General Letitia James. Now, in his videotaped pretrial deposition during the discovery phase of this trial, Trump kept his cool. He never got rattled as he refused to answer questions by calmly pleading the fifth. But his testimony today is going to be different because this is not a criminal trial. This is a civil trial where pleading the fifth works against the defendant, especially in a New York state civil suit where the judge is permitted to view a defendant relying on the fifth to mean he's hiding something, which in Trump's case he is. So what's going to happen today? Trump can plead the fifth, look like a coward, or he can go for it and risk committing perjury. Now, the judge in this trial has already ruled that the Trump organization is guilty of fraud, and the judge ordered it into receivership with all its properties to be sold off. Trump has already lost this. He's going to appeal the decision, and the purpose of Trump's testimony today, as well as the rest of the trial, the purpose of all this, is to assist the judge in determining how much to fine Trump and his adult children. We keep hearing $250 million. It's way above that. Uh, Letitia James picked that number two years ago, but then when she went over the books during Discovery, she said it is a staggering amount of fraud. He conceivably could be hit with a $1 billion, $2 billion fine, and he'll have to sell Mar-a-Lago, and he'll get $18 million for it. So if Trump is smart, and he's not, but he's done this, he's done this a lot, he's testified under oath. If Trump is smart, he'll play the long game today by keeping his answer short, vague, He'll play out the clock, which he's great at. He'll try not to plead the fifth, and he'll try not to perjure himself. Trump has done this before. Maybe more than anybody, Judge Arthur Engeron or Letitia James, has ever come across. So I have no doubt, unfortunately, he's going to walk away from his testimony today unscathed. Now, he's already been found guilty in the case, and he's already planning to appeal. The last thing he needs today is a perjury rap, and I don't think he's, I don't think he's gonna commit perjury. He's too smart. The good thing is I'm always wrong. So if I say he's not gonna commit perjury and he's gonna walk away unscathed, odds are it's gonna be a nightmare for him. But all he needs to do today is insist as far as he knew his properties were worth 
2,500 times what they actually were worth. Unfortunately, that's what he's going to say. And it's going to sound okay. It's going to sound okay. Eventually, this goes before an appeals court, and it won't sound okay. But we're talking about the here and now. It's going to sound okay. He's going to say, I suspect, when I was elected president, I turned my holdings over to the accountants and the lawyers. In essence, it was a blind trust. I don't even think I'm allowed to know what I was signing or what was in those financial statements because it would create a conflict of interest while I'm serving as president of the United States. I can hear him saying that, and I think he will. Then he's going to talk about how much money he lost being president and all the business opportunities he missed out on. So, no, he's going to say, I just signed those documents. I didn't sign them. I had Don Jr. sign them. And, uh, and I expected, he's going to say, I expected Don Jr. and Eric to just sign them without paying too close attention to what was inside of them because we're a close family. And we talk, and the last thing I wanted was for them to say something about our real estate holdings that might influence my decision-making as president. I can hear him say that. I can hear him say, you know, I wanted it to be a blind trust for the entire family. Leave it to the accountants and the lawyers so we as a family are free to talk about whatever we want without any conflict of interest as I serve the people. That's what I think, that's what he should say. Uh, then I think, I know he's going to say, I believe Mar-a-Lago is worth $2 billion. Now, you're telling me that there are attachments to the property saying it can't ever be sold or developed. Uh, I never heard of these attachments. And if they exist, trust me, there are ways around them. Believe me, if I wanted to sell Mar-a-Lago so it could be developed, there are ways to renegotiate with the city to free the property up for development. Nothing is set in stone. We do that all the time. I think he's going to say that, and it's going to sound convincing for the time being. Uh, then they're going to say, well, how did you arrive at Mar-a-Lago being worth half a billion dollars? Uh, how do I know Mar-a-Lago is worth half a billion dollars or two billion? Well, he's going to say there's only one way to find out, and that's by putting it on the market. He's going to say appraisals are anything but an exact science. And, now, and this is where I think if he does this, I think it's this is so depressing. I hate thinking like a criminal. I think he's going to say, and it's going to sound okay, he's going to say, uh, how did I get to $2 billion? I was president of the United States, and Mar-a-Lago was my winter White House. How do you put a price on something so historical? You know, it's almost true. And he'll get away with it, like I said, for the time being. Again, he's already lost the case. All he needs to do is prove there was no criminal intent. He didn't think he was committing fraud. And that will hold him till the appeal. So he can spin it. I really think he comes out of this unscathed. I hate saying that. Uh, don't get me wrong. Trump is guilty. But with Trump, it's all about living to fight another day. And I regret to inform everybody, I think he comes off the stand today and tomorrow relatively unscathed, especially since his testimony won't be televised. Again, Trump has already been found guilty of filling out phony financial statements that inflate the value of his properties in order to convince lenders and insurance companies he was wealthier than he actually is. By painting himself as a multi-billionaire, Trump was able to borrow more money and because his phony statements made him appear less of a risk, he was able to secure loans 
at much lower interest rates that, according to an expert witness, saved him several hundred million dollars. So during his testimony, I predict he's going he's gonna to be saying the banks got their money back with interest. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is, and I talked about this on Thursday's show, the problem is the banks sell money and they charge more for the money based on how risky a loan you are. Trump might have paid those loans back, but he should have been paying a much higher interest rate because he was a bigger risk than he let on. That's why he's guilty of fraud. According to this indictment, Trump inflated the value of his properties when securing loans, but deflated the value of his properties when it came time to pay his taxes. The line of questioning we're most likely to hear today will focus on Mar-a-Lago, the private club in Palm Beach, right, Florida. Trump insists it's worth $2 billion, and this is where he gets tripped up but it's been appraised by the local tax assessor as being worth less than $20 million. And Trump has agreed to that assessment. He signed a document attesting to that number of $20 million, which means instead of paying taxes on a $2 billion property, he's paying taxes on a $20 million property. And that's the second prong of this indictment, uh, of this civil fraud case, that Letitia James has hardly touched upon, tax fraud, tax fraud. So far, all the testimony has been about how Trump ripped off banks and insurance companies. We haven't heard anything about tax fraud, which she promised is part of this case. Trump is going to have a hard time explaining why his financial statements repeatedly list Mar-a-Lago as being worth half a billion dollars. But when it comes time to pay taxes on Mar-a-Lago, he says it's worth less than 20 million. This is where he's going to get tripped up. According to the original civil lawsuit filed by the New York State Attorney General's office, He is guilty of double fraud, okay? Trump, over the years, signed documents to lower his local taxes if he promised to leave Mar-a-Lago as a private club, as part of an historic preservation trust that prevents him from ever selling the property to developers. So he's not going to be able to explain today why... If Mar-a-Lago is worth half a billion dollars, like his financial statements so state, why is he paying taxes on Mar-a-Lago as though it's worth only $20 million? Now, so what does Trump say if you're his lawyer? You say, Donald, just say, I don't know anything about that. Say, I have a large business. I own many properties. And this is what the accountants are for. That's what he's going to say. It's going to be very unsatisfying. I'm sure the attorney general will put before him uh, emails and documents proving that Donald Trump was fully aware of what he paid in taxes on the property, fully aware that it was assessed at $20 million. But... Those documents that she's going to present to him, he's going to say, you know, a lot of documents come across my desk. I don't have time to read them, especially when I was president of the United States. You know, Trump is a mafia don. We know for a fact that he clogged the White House toilets, flushing papers with his writing on it. That's a fact. He was, anything he wrote down, he flushed down the toilet because he leaves no paper trail like a mafia don. He's a mobster. He knows exactly what he's doing. Unfortunately, and I hope I'm wrong, 
this testimony that he's going to give today, he's better at this than the judge and the attorney general. He's had more practice. I hope to be pleasantly surprised. Like I said, the trial is not televised. So Trump needs to only play to the judge and the courtroom reporters. Again, he's already lost the case. So what, what, what should we expect today? Some grandstanding within the confines of what is permissible under oath. Uh, he's been sued what, like 5,000 times. I'm not making that up. He's, he's pushing 80. He's been sued 5,000 times. He's a master at parsing words. And he's going to end up saying it was my understanding that everything about Mar-a-Lago was perfectly legal. Everything about Trump Tower was perfectly legal. And I was just acting on advice from my accountants and lawyers and I was busy trying to create a wall between the White House and my business interests. It's good that I don't know about this stuff. Damn it. This is what he's going to do today. I feel it in my bones. I don't think he gets stung today. I don't. There won't be that kill shot. He won't break under oath. He will be petulant and still insist he didn't break the law, and that uh, I know in my heart of hearts I can get $2 billion from Mar-a-Lago. And when you present him with facts, he'll just say, I guess we have to agree to disagree. We'll find out in my appeal, he'll say. He's too good at this. And he knows what the prize is today and tomorrow. It's about saving face. Uh, the one humiliation he might suffer is admitting that he knows very little about the day-to-day -day operations of his companies. But again, his plausible deniability on that front will be, I was running the White House. I didn't have time. So it pains me to say this. If you're looking for what he calls a Perry Mason moment today, not going to happen. Here's the good news. I'm usually wrong. I'm usually wrong. His daughter, Ivanka, takes the stand on Wednesday. And that's where Trump could suffer some serious emotional damage. Ivanka could either end up committing perjury and thereby throwing herself back into a mess her lawyers had successfully extirpated her from, or she can tell the truth about her father. She has a lot of explaining to do. There may be something very satisfying here with Ivanka. This might be very satisfying. She testifies on Wednesday, right? She has a lot of explaining to do. Before taking her job in the Oval Office, Ivanka was the Trump Organization's point person with Deutsche Bank. During her testimony before the January 6th committee, she threw Daddy under the bus and agreed that Bill Barr, Trump's attorney general, was correct when he said there was no evidence of voter fraud. Ivanka severed herself from this civil trial by getting a lawyer a lawyer separate from her two brothers, and she succeeded in getting her name off these charges. But, but, we might be very satisfied on Wednesday as she perhaps implicates herself. Why did Ivanka fight so hard not to testify in this trial? What is she hiding? Ivanka, we know, took the lead in the purchase of two Trump properties uh, that the New York State Attorney General says were grossly overvalued, the Doral Hotel in Miami and the Trump Hotel in Washington, D.C. She was the point person on the loans, and she worked with the GSA, 
the General Services Administration, to be able to lease the old post office for the Trump Hotel in D.C. There is, according to the New York State Attorney General, there is enough evidence to suggest that when Ivanka handed the Trump Organization's financials to the GSA to get the lease on the old post office building, she was lying about how much money the, the organization had, and she could be found guilty of defrauding the federal government. Dan Alexander at Forbes has written extensively about the Trump family's obsessive, desperate attempts to be included in the magazine's annual list of the 400 richest. He writes that in 2015, Ivanka spoke with three Forbes journalists who were vetting Trump for the 400 richest. Uh, three journalists uh, spoke uh, to Ivanka about the Doral Hotel, and she lied and said it had 150,000 square feet of meeting space, even though the Trump brochure on the Doral Hotel, sitting right in front of them on the desk, said the property only had 90,000 feet of meeting space. As she worked to get her father on the list, the, the richest 400, she told the three reporters from Forbes vetting the family that Donald had zero debt on the Doral Hotel. She completely ignored the $125 million the Trump Organization borrowed to purchase the Doral Hotel. Ivanka insisted the Doral Hotel was worth $225 million. Then the CFO of Trump Org, Alan Weisselberg, said, no, it's only worth $119 million because of the debt still owed on it. Ivanka interrupted Alan Weisselberg and said, that's a joke. She was lying, according to Forbes. In the same meeting, Donald Trump admitted that they had mortgages on the Doral, but he bragged that he was only paying 2% interest on them. Ivanka lied and said, no, we're only paying 1.7% interest on them, when in fact it was 2.1%. All part of the deception to convince Forbes her father was richer than he really was. Why the lie? Because the richer the world thinks Donald Trump is, the lower the interest rates on the money he borrows. Remember, the higher the risk, the higher the interest rates. Now, like I said earlier, paying 1.7% interest on the Doral versus 2.1% interest on the Doral might seem like nothing to you and me, but we're talking about the difference between millions and millions of dollars in interest that Trump doesn't have to pay based on a lie. This is the mop-up for November 6, 2023. Please share this with your friends. Please comment. This is uh, difficult stuff. It's finance. If I'm getting anything wrong, please let me know in the comments section. Ugh, water. Donald Trump's hold over Republican voters remains staggering and terrifying. The New York Times says, with the presidential election now one year away, polling shows Trump leading Biden in five out of six battleground states. Again, these are polls, and a lot will happen between now and Election Day. But candidates and donors read polls, and they adjust accordingly. That's why polls matter. The reason polls this far out are usually inaccurate when it comes to predicting the final results is candidates tack with the winds. So polls are important because they drive policy and positions in the lead up to the election. So 
it's not that the polls are getting something wrong. It's informa- polls are information for the candidates to adjust. For example, Michigan. This is a key battleground state that Hillary lost, but Biden won. Democrats have made tremendous headway in the past two years, turning Michigan into a solid blue state. You know what helps, Hillary, uh, when you campaign in Michigan? That's uh, something she forgot to do. Michigan has a Democratic governor, and the Democrats control both state houses, along with a Democratic attorney general and a Democratic secretary of state. Biden made it a point to march in Detroit with the United Auto Workers, whose settlement with the big three car makers Biden can campaign on. But Michigan also has the second largest population of Arab Americans right behind California. Now, I'm going to talk about something here. And I don't want to sound glib. I'm going to talk about Gaza and I'm going to talk about Israel at the end of the show because it's so sad. And I I talk about Israel and Gaza at the end because it's very sad. Uh, So I don't mean to use this tragedy to horse race a presidential election. But it is political. So I don't mean to trivialize this, but uh, let me just report what's going on in Detroit and how this, how this moves policy. Michigan has the second largest population of Arab Americans, uh, right behind California. Uh, Democrat Rashida Tlaib is the only Palestinian American who serves in Congress. Everybody should donate to Rashida Tlaib. We need brave Democrats like Rashida Tlaib. Uh, The only Palestinian American serving in Congress. She represents parts of Dearborn, Michigan, which has one of the highest concentration of Arabs in America. And over the weekend, Congressman Tlaib put out a campaign ad that hammered President Biden's unwavering support for Israel's war on Gaza. Speaking for the Arab community that she represents, Tlaib looked into the camera and told Biden she and other Palestinian Americans will remember this in 2024. So, again, I will talk about the tragedy, but it's also political, okay? Because this this is, presidents want to get reelected. Uh, Trump, according to this New York Times poll, leads Biden by five points in Michigan. There is the issue of Gaza saving lives. There's the issue of Hamas and the massacre in Israel. Uh, There's the issue of Islamophobia here in America. There's the issue of anti-Semitism here in America. And then there's the issue of winning Michigan. We're talking politics right now. It's a little unseemly, but again, these polls are what move policy. And this poll, by the way, is interesting and suspect. It shows Donald Trump getting something like 22% of the African American vote with Joe, Bi- you know, versus Joe Biden. So these polls are, you know, if, if I got if I got called, I'd give goofy answers myself, but. Joe Biden's response to the situation in Gaza and Israel has been unlimited support for Israel, condemning Hamas, 
while at the same time urging Congress to restock Israel's arsenal of weapons, especially the anti-ballistic missiles for Iron Dome, which keep Israel safe from the thousands of rockets fired by Hamas from Gaza. Those rockets are still landing in Israel. At the same time, Biden has spoken out uh, against uh, the deaths of innocent civilians and has tried to sever Hamas from the Palestinian people. And he has warned, at first he warned against Israel's ground invasion and has now called for a ceasefire. But instead of a ceasefire, he's calling it a humanitarian pause. There's no question. Well, I'll be careful what I say here. Now, Trump, on the other hand, has said for every drop of Israeli blood, there should be a gallon of Palestinian blood. He has promised to bring back the Muslim ban when he's elected, if he's elected. So, from a purely political point of view, uh, I'm going to move on. It's a little gross. Uh, not going to talk about this. It's gross. Uh, by a 300... Nah, that's gross, too. This is the mop-up for November 6, 2023. Tomorrow is Election Day. Are you registered to vote? Are you registered? Uh, only 40% of Americans who can vote do vote. Uh, this really is about democracy. The more I read about John Eastman and the Claremont Center and what these people really want is they want to get rid of democracy. And at some point, that has to be the question these Republicans are asked. Do you believe in democracy? Do you believe that this should be a republic? Um, the way to protect this republic is to make sure you vote and to make sure you vote for Democratic candidates, warts and all, warts and all. The Israel-Hamas war now enters its 30th day. 4,000 children in Gaza are believed to have been killed by Israeli airstrikes since fighting began. UNICEF estimates that on average 420 children in Gaza are killed or injured each day since the fighting began. Michael Herzog, the Israeli ambassador to the United States, told CBS News that Hamas has turned Gaza into the world's largest terror complex with tens of thousands of soldiers, hundreds of miles of tunnels, and an unlimited cache of weapons, much of which are provided by Iran. Israel insists Hamas is using Palestinian children in Gaza as human shields. Israel is urging residents of northern Gaza to move south, where humanitarian aid would await them. Israel says they are at war with the 40,000 Hamas soldiers in the north and not the Palestinians. Israel said its top priority now is to take out Yahya Sinwar, the head of Hamas in Gaza, and they have vowed not to stop until they get him. Fighting continued in northern Israel with Hezbollah along the Lebanon border. Israel says it took out three of the Iranian-backed group's terror cells. Lebanese Foreign Minister... Hang on. There we go. Lebanese Foreign Minister Abdallah Abu Habib said on Sunday that Lebanon is doing everything it can to prevent a war between Israel and Hezbollah. Hezbollah, whose military is separate from Lebanon's, and has as many as 150,000 missiles pointing at Israel. So Hezbollah is backed by Iran. It's in southern Lebanon. It has its own army, 
Lebanon has its own army as well. And Hezbollah over the years has also become a political faction and, uh, and representatives of Hezbollah uh, serve in Lebanon's parliament. But there are two armies in Lebanon. There's the official government's army and then there's Iran's Hezbollah. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, confirmed that he met with Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh and supports his efforts to defeat Israel. Israel said Hamas's leadership travels in private jets while their own people have no food. With Iran openly funding both Hamas and Hezbollah, it remains to be seen what kind of thaw can be expected in America's relations with the Persian Gulf state. Biden and Obama thought such a thing was possible, while Trump and most Republicans say it is not. Many believe the October 7 massacre is very much related to Israel and Saudi Arabia normalizing diplomatic relations. Iran and Saudi Arabia are fighting a proxy war in Yemen, and the last thing Iran wants is a security arrangement between Israel and Saudi Arabia guaranteed by the United States. So Iran is now turning to Moscow for help to counterbalance the U.S.-Israeli-Saudi Arabian Power Alliance. It is in Moscow's best interest to keep America distracted by the fighting going on in Gaza and Israel so that America pays less attention to supporting Ukraine. We are already seeing cracks in the NATO alliance as Republicans in the House say they are willing to provide $14 billion to Israel, but not $60 billion to Ukraine. This is why Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer say funding for Israel and Ukraine can't be separated. They're both connected, they say, since the war against Putin is very much connected to the war against Hamas and Iran. Dozens of Palestinians were killed Sunday after Israeli missile strikes hit two refugee camps in Gaza. President Joe Biden continued to urge Israel to take a humanitarian pause from the shelling. But Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said no ceasefire is possible until Hamas frees the hostages. It is now believed Hamas took 242 hostages during their October 7th massacre. Nobody knows how many hostages are still alive. President Biden has reportedly said privately he doubts Benjamin Netanyahu can stay in power much longer as more Israelis hold him responsible for not doing enough to protect them on October 7th. The United Nations says the average Palestinian living in Gaza is getting by on two pieces of bread per day. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken visited the West Bank to hold talks with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, who, as leader of Fatah, is the political rival of Hamas. Fatah controls the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Hamas controls Gaza. The two parties fought a civil war back in 2006. Bernie Sanders said on Sunday he doesn't know if it's possible to have a ceasefire with Hamas. Bernie said, quote, I don't know how you can have a ceasefire, a permanent ceasefire, with an organization like Hamas, which is dedicated to turmoil and chaos and destroying the state of Israel. In recent years, Hamas said it was willing to accept a two-state solution but only as a temporary step towards the annihilation of Israel. Recent polling, according to Foreign Affairs magazine, shows Fatah, the moderate party, is more popular in Gaza than Hamas, which is the ruling party 
in Gaza and the last time they held elections, Hamas beat Fatah. Hamas beat Fatah in elections held more than 15 years ago. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, we've talked about this, encouraged Qatar to shower Hamas with hundreds of millions of dollars in order to keep Gaza running, but also to serve as a counterbalance to Fatah in order to make a two-state solution seem impossible. Um, if you, I don't mean, if you haven't followed this closely, um, it, it, I recommend finding out what Fatah is and how it, how it's different from Hamas. Uh, I recommend looking at a map and seeing where the West Bank is and where the, where the Gaza Strip is. The West Bank is where the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, Fatah, the moderate elements of uh, the Palestinian people reside in in the West Bank. Uh, And because of the conditions in Gaza, a more radical uh, party, Hamas, with the help of Benjamin Netanyahu and Qatar, uh, has come to power in uh, in Gaza. If a two-state solution is possible, uh, conventional wisdom is that America and Israel need to prop up Fatah uh, and uh, the polling on this suggests that the Palestinian people, uh, even in Gaza, would prefer Fatah than Hamas. It's very complicated. It's not easy. Uh, it's not easy to understand. And it's not easy to get a, a peaceful resolution to this. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, killed the two-state solution. He, he put together a coalition of ethno-nationalists who uh, don't want a two-state solution. And this is what he's wrought. This was since his co... I won't blame Benjamin Netanyahu for the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. I thought Yitzhak Rabin's wife did a pretty good job of that all by herself, so I will not hold Benjamin Netanyahu accountable for the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. But when Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated, uh, it was to destroy the hopes of a two-state solution. He was the prime minister who was pushing the Oslo Accords. There are some nasty right-wing ethno-nationalists who uh, took over Israel and killed the two-state solution. And this is what you end up with. So uh, hopefully Benjamin Netanyahu will be forced to resign and be held accountable for this intelligence failure uh, on uh, October 7th. It's very complicated. Uh, So I'm trying to be as balanced as I possibly can. You probably know what I think. Uh, I don't know what I think. I have a rough idea of what I think. I just know the answer is to end the cycle of violence. Uh, But I listen to Bernie, and Hamas is Hamas. And there's a difference between Hamas and the Palestinian people. There are about 40,000 soldiers in Gaza Hamas soldiers, and uh, what they did on October 7th is part of their charter, and uh, what's going on is the ultimate nightmare. It's the ultimate nightmare, what's going on in Gaza right now. I don't have any answers other than 
uh, peace, love, and forgiveness. Peace, love, and forgiveness is the answer and, and negotiating. And, and, uh, and, and just an end to the killing. <sighs> okay. Uh, that's the show. Please like this. Sorry, remain in your feed. I, uh, please uh, share this. Thank you to the mods in the chat room. Uh, oh, I... Uh, this is... I'll show you uh, Halloween in New York. This is what all the jack-o'-lanterns and uh, this is what happens to them days after. It's really disgusting. Look at this. I, I walked around today taking pictures of the way they treat the jack-o'-lanterns here in New York City. Look at this. I don't know why anybody would want to live in New York when they treat jack-o'-lanterns. Look at that poor jack-o'-lantern. He brought so much joy on Halloween, and he's just discarded. Look at this one. They put cigarette, they put out cigarettes in his brain. Who does that to a jack-o'-lantern? Like Halloween isn't, hasn't even been over for a week. Look at these guys just hanging out, nobody helping them. It's just so depressing. It's very depressing city. Look at this. I just walked around New York today and I thought, why do I live here? Everything's commodified. Look at that. Let me go back there. That's so sad. Look at this poor guy. Look at that. Look at the rats eating the jack-o'-lanterns. The police just walk right by it. Nobody there to help. Look at the rats eating the jack-o'-lanterns. Yeah, thanks. You were very fun to be around leading up to Halloween, but now you're nothing. Just go away. Go rot somewhere. We don't need you. Look at that. No place for them. Rats chewing on the brains there. This is New York. Look like kids see this. Look at that. Horrible, horrible place to live, New York City. I'm David Feldman, reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. Thank you all. Thank you to Bob in the chat room.